And I just hope that we realize that we can't keep hearing these messages. We can't keep having conferences. We've got to become active. And we've got to start actively promoting pro-life in all the different areas of our country. Out of all the doctors that are qualifying in South Africa, there's one that took a stand and he was taken before the HPCSA because he spoke to one of his patients about the humanity of the child she was carrying in her. Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, can I put this challenge to you? What has been happening? What have you been doing in the past year? We've got an example of one doctor who refused to perform abortions and he was stopped by the HPCSA and about eight years later, he was allowed to start practicing as a doctor. There should be many, many more like that. Dr. Peter Hammond is the founder of Frontline Fellowship, the Reformation Society, Africa Christian Action, and the William Key Revival Institute. He's a missionary member of the Livingston Fellowship, is also the chairman of the Reformation Society, author and co-author of many books, including Fight for Life, Pro-Life Handbook for Southern Africa. Dr. Hammond is a pioneer missionary to some of the worst war-torn zones in the world. Since his conversion in 1977, he has served persecuted churches and pioneered evangelistic outreaches into Mozambique, Angola, Sudan, Rwanda, Congo, and Nigeria. He has helped him establish 100 Christian schools and numerous Bible colleges throughout Africa. So put your hands together to talk to him. Thank you so much, Dr. Elgin. Good afternoon. I greet you in the precious name of our Lord and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I bring you greetings from our fellowship in Cape Town. Tomorrow we'll be having the March for Life in Cape Town. And uh, we've been for 30 years running Marches for Life in Cape Town, Make Stands for Life, uh, Marches to Parliament, or International Life Change Sunday. We are commanded to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. In 1959, my mother, Ingrid Hammond, was pregnant with me and she is advised by a gynecologist at St. Joseph's Hospital, which is Vincent Pilates in Cape Town, to abort me. Because my mother had been taking my tablets, which was the wonder drug that protected you from morning sickness and suppressed all those symptoms. But as the hysteria grew, as more and more babies, in the end hundreds of thousands were born, deformed, without arms, legs, eyes in some cases, uh, they not only permitted abortions, but they were recommending abortions in the case of mothers who had taken the obviously deforming drug, the lermite. So my mother, being a lifelong nurse who had received uh, the National Award for Nursing in England by Harold Macmillan, presented that, uh, she was, it's even a picture of her, um, being uh, given an award by Harold Macmillan, the British Prime Minister is famous for the Winds of Change speech. My mother was serious about the Florence Nightingale pledge, which included doing no harm to your patients and caring for the patient's welfare. And my mother, in fact, she lived for crises and emergencies. I remember my mother coming home sometimes saying, my day is not complete if I haven't seen blood. And I think she was, she was often disappointed that none of her children were interested in medicine and didn't follow into nursing. She, kept telling me she wanted me to be a medical doctor and you got surgeon's fingers and I think she was extremely disappointed when I wasted my life in missions. But uh, she did come to the Lord later. So my mother called for a chaplain to come uh, in the hospital. She still doesn't know whether it was a Catholic or Protestant chaplain, uh, but a chaplain came, prayed for her, prayed for the baby. And as you can see, I've got my hands, my eyes, my legs. Uh, and so God was merciful, gracious. Praise God that she, 
um, shows life. The scripture says, for you to create it, for me, for you create my innermost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. And it's so important for us to be true to these principles. Some years ago, I was debating the head of the abortion rights action group, Dr. Marge Dyer. We used to call her Dr. Death. Dr. Marge Dyer uh, at Stellenbosch University, and I mentioned this testimony. And a very large smile came across her face. I debated Marge Dyer many times, so any time I ever saw a smile. Big smile, as I mentioned, that my mother almost aborted her. And she said audibly for everyone in the auditorium here, what a pity she did this. <laughs> and quite shocking that a medical doctor could take delight at the thought of an abortion. So pro-choice, that's a lie. Babies don't choose to die. And they say they're pro-choice, but they're not really pro-choice, as I noticed Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who God your life know it? Will he not repay each one according to what he has done? Now this passage in Proverbs 24 is something of a threat. God guards your life. The Lord decides when and how are you dying. Do you really want to anger God by showing contempt to the right to life of others? And so this is a bit of a threat. God weighs your heart. He guards your life. And what we sow is what we reap. And the way we treat the right to life of others is how our lives will be treated. Have you noticed how the generation that legalized abortion of the generation who've been euthanized? I mean, just take the Netherlands, for example, where euthanasia is legal and where state doctors have decided on an average year to, to euthanize a thousand patients without the patient's request or the, pa or the patient's parent or relatives even requesting. So the people who disrespect the right to life of the youngest and the most vulnerable are the ones who could get euthanized by some state doctor's arbitrary decision one day. What we sow is what we need. And yes, will he not repay each one to what he has done? At a meeting in Athlone in Cape Town, I heard Ronald Sider, famous American author, Ronald Sider, give his support for the one-child policy of Red China. Communist China, as you know, for many years had this one-child policy, you could only have one child, and what happened? Those who had more than one child, the child was either infanticized or uh, they sterilized the people. There was all kinds of pressure. You could only have one child, and then in many families, they started reporting stillbirth if it was a girl being born. And China's got a massive imbalance of far too many males and far too few females, because many families decide to strangle or smother or drown the baby girl at birth that they could have another child because they wanted a male child. So where's the choice there? For a Christian evangelical author to stand up and say, we support the one-child policy of Red China. Well, that's no choice at all. That's just pro-abortion. That's pro-death. That's not pro-choice in any sense. And that's why the scripture tells us, do not pollute the land where you are. Bloodshed pollutes the land. Atonement cannot be made for the land on which blood has been shed, except by the blood of the one who shed it. It's an extremely serious thing to allow an innocent person to die and to fail to stand up for the innocent. That is one reason why we march to Parliament every year. We make a stand at the gates of Parliament, because the scripture says that when innocent blood is shed and when you cannot bring to justice the criminal responsible, the leaders of the city, the elders, should go to the gates of the city and make clear this murder was not done in, in our sight. We knew nothing about it. We had no part in Or God will judge the entire nation. A curse comes upon a nation where innocent blood is shed. We can sing in Corsi Sicily Africa all we like. God will not bless a country that murders its babies. How can God bless a country that kills its own people? So shame upon us there. And shame upon these leaders, as our brother said in the devotions, shame upon those who've got a greater responsibility, the church leaders, the religious leaders, who are silent, who are cowards, who refuse to make a stand. Well, in 1987, at Kirchentag in Frankfurt, Germany, I saw a pro-abortion demonstration. It was quite disgusting. 
the Christian Talk, which was run by the World Muslim Federation, would not allow the pro-lifers to have a store inside the uh, Christian Talk facilities. They were too controversial. So the eight pro-life groups in Germany were denied an opportunity to be represented at the Christian Talk. But I can tell you who were there, not only pro-abortion groups, there were also terrorist groups, there were Sandinista, Sparta, ANC, they all had a desk there, the LGBT crowd had pro-homosexuality and so on. They had stores, they weren't controversial apparently. So the pro-lifers had a demonstration outside the gates of the Christian Talk venue, and it was a pro-abortion counter-demonstration within the gates of Christian Talk. And one of the banners that I saw, quite shocking, oh, Dr. Ernst, what a pity your mother didn't abort you. Dr. Ernst, presumably a leader in the pro-life movement in Germany. But then it was an even worse, even more shocking anti-life banner there. If only Mary had had an abortion, we wouldn't have these problems today. At a church conference, that's not pro-choice, that's pro-abortion, that's not just pro-abortion, that's pro-death, that's anti -anti actually anti-Christ, not just anti-life, but anti-Christ. I've seen pictures of that at other places where somebody put up banners, if only Mary had an abortion, in America, uh, as well as England, so this is a sentiment quite a few people had. The biggest curse that ever happened in the world was the birth of Jesus Christ, according to some of these people. If only Christ had been born, we wouldn't have these Christians, we wouldn't have these pro-lifers. What a wonderful world it would be if Mary had had an abortion. Just think about that. Well, there's a book written, What if Jesus had been born? Which I think is the right book to read. I Dr. James Haley pointing out everything good in our society, absolutely everything good, comes from Jesus Christ and his teachers. Everything from hospitals to schools, literacy, all the different things we take for granted, the abolition of slavery, the ending of cannibalism, human sacrificing, it all came from the teaching and example of Jesus Christ and his followers. So in fact, life wouldn't even be worth living, assuming we need to be alive, if Jesus had not been born. But there's some people who would like to wish Jesus away. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will make a stand for me against the workers of iniquity? We need Christians who are going to get some backbone. Martin Luther said, that if we profess every truth except that point which is under attack at that moment, we're not confessing Christ, however boldly we might be professing. For where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldiers proved. And to be steady in all the battlefront besides, it's mere flight and disgrace if he glimpses at that point. We need to be faithful where the battle rages. And the right to life is such a key battle, it's the battle. But there's other battles today too. And you can be deplatformed and accused of being hateful bigots if you say something like, well, there's only two genders, or marriage can only be between a man and a woman. And to think that something as basic as that can get you into trouble. But then we even got into trouble and were accused of being selfish when we wanted to breathe fresh air. Who would imagine when people didn't want to wear the muzzle masquerade face cipher during the masquerade madness, lockdown, lunacy, salvation by vaccination, COVID cult, we had a church in Cape Town, Methodist church in Cape Town. They put up on their beautiful stone church on Greenpoint, um, I should say Green Market Square, lovely stone um, tower. They put down a big yellow banner. The blood of Jesus Christ cannot save you from COVID-19. Only vaccination can. Get vaccinated now. Now that's such blasphemous garbage. It's not only a lot of laughable and stupid, but what they should have had is no vaccine can save you from the fires of hell. Only the blood of Jesus can. Okay? That could be more. There's an anti-Christian element to the pro-abortion side. What we are facing at this stage is a phenomenal anti-Christian hostility. In 1990, when my wife Lenora was pregnant and we were expecting our first child, we attended a pro-abortion rally in on probably the first pro-abortion rally in our country's um, history. It was run by Dr. March Dye of the Abortion Rights Action Group, and it was at Rondebosch Congregational Church, or Rondebosch, Cong Rondebosch Congregational Church, which is now the Union Church. March Dye was promoting the legalization of abortion on demand, and there was a shocking incident that I could never forget. A middle-aged woman stood up at the back and she said, 
20 years ago, I needed to have an abortion, but the apartheid laws wouldn't let me abort my baby. She did. And then she identified the young girl sitting next to her as her daughter. And she said, there's not a day that goes by in the last 20 years that I haven't regretted that I was denied the right to have a choice of my own body. Oh. And her daughter sitting there nodding her head. Yeah. It was bizarre. It was like you'd fallen through the rabbit hole and you're ending up there uh, at Mad Hatter's Sea Point. The daughter agreeing. That reminds me of Chelsea Clinton, the Clinton's daughter. People have said, um, what do you get if you mix a communist with a lesbian? The answer is Chelsea. Um, well, anyway, so Bill and Hillary Clinton's daughter, Chelsea, was thinking of playing her parents were saying that she regretted that her grandparents were denied the empowerment that Planned Parenthood had uh, given her generation. And what she's saying is she's saying she wished her parents had been aborted, which maybe she was. Does that mean she didn't think it was worth her living alone? But that's just some of the stupid things you hear people say. So can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on a child she had born? Though she may forget, I will never forget you, says it all. Now you would have thought that a hypothetical question, could a mother really abandon her child? But of course they do all the time. Rome was built by Romulus and Remus who were abandoned uh, by their own mother. And a she-wolf had more maternal instincts than the mother. And a wolf raised Romulus and Remus and Rome was built by Romulus, in the name. And yet Rome did not seem to learn a thing from us. Rome had a place outside every city where you could abandon your uh, children, you could abandon babies, literally throw them to the wolves, and uh, that was what, where the term throwing them to the wolves came from. Rome abandoned their children. And it said that the early church grew more by adopting of children than it did even from evangelism. Well, while I was studying at Theological Seminary, I had a very memorable supper with a married couple from the college. And over the meal in the home, my host disclosed that when, before they were married, they had a crisis pregnancy. And uh, he was the youth leader at his church. And uh, his, fiance, his future fiance's girlfriend was pregnant. And her brother was high up in the denomination. In fact, he went to be president of the denomination. And her father was a very senior leader in the church as well. So it was decided that this was just too inconvenient, too embarrassing. She had to get an abortion. So her father, a senior leader in the church, put her on a plane at Jansmat Airport to go off to England to have an abortion. And he prayed for journey mercies as he sent his daughter to kill his grandchild. And she said of the supper, something died within me. I thought, yes, I would imagine something would die within you. Your father praying for journey mercies as you go off to kill his grandchild? If you wonder why church is on a mess they're in, look no further. How many ministers in our churches decided to rather abort the child because their respectability, their ministry was more important than this, that life, more important than life itself? I've got a great suspicion that there's a lot of that out there because you wonder why most pastors are not preaching against pornography. Well, I've spoken at youth rallies against pornography, and next thing you know, long stream of kids coming wanting counsel, and one youth leader said, I never felt it was good or right, but because they never spoke about it from the pulpit, I thought, it's probably that serious. But I've got youngsters in the youth group coming to me how to get free, and I don't know how to get free myself. And you wonder, well, why is this not being preached against? Why can we not speak from the pulpit against them? So, yes, their sin is great. Uh, Though she delivered you to me, Pilate said, uh, our Lord said to Pilate, I'm guilty of a greater sin. And it is a terrible sin not to be steady on that battlefront where the battle rages. Um, the cowardice, the compromise, the treachery, the treason of those people who meant to serve Christ who are as good as Judas because they're selling the truth of the gospel and the lives of the unborn for less than 30 pieces of silver. A greater condemnation will come to these religious leaders guilty of cowardice. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. The land was polluted with their blood. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people, so that he had poured his own inheritance, and he gave them over into the hands of the Gentiles, and those who hated them ruled over them. 
The enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. I'm sure many of you have seen the film Unplanned. We had the privilege of showing the Unplanned film as a premiere in Cape Town and promoting it. But as my wife pointed out, the book is better. And uh, it's always so. In the Unplanned book, we learned more. We learned that while she was the director of this abortion clinic that was murdering babies, she was a respected member of a local Presbyterian church. But the moment she became a pro-life activist, the church leaders ordered her to leave. You wonder about Abby Johnson. She could be a, an abortionist and be a member of a Presbyterian church. She could not be a pro-life activist. They told her to leave because she was bringing the church into disrepute and controversy. Why is the church in a mess? Why does revival tarry? How many churches do we have like this? Remember in the film, one of the elements was a killer, killer the tiller, the third trimester abortionist who was killed. Where was he killed? In church. He was a deacon of a Lutheran church. And he was murdered at church, which of course is terrible. I mean, that just plays in the hands of enemy. We don't take up their tactics. But the fact is, what was a church doing having a church leader? I think he was a deacon, is that correct? Um, killer. Killer of the killer. Killer of the killer. Um, but how, how is that possible? That you can be an abortionist in a church. That's fine. You can be a leadership. But don't bring controversy to the church by being a pro-lifer. Now, that family that I mentioned, whose family on all sides were high up in the denomination, I spoke in the church of this friend from college much later in life, and now his wife was sitting there with a baby on his on her lap. Now, I know people who've had abortions greatly regret and speak against the use of the ministry to oppose it. But in this occasion, they were mocking my pro-life stand and deliberately scorning the pro-life stand of African Christianity. So they haven't learned, they've just gotten more embittered. Do you think they, there was a church finding opposition from a pastor and his wife who used to be friends at college, but I knew, and they knew that I knew, that they had aborted their baby, and they thought hiding that is more important. Respectability and your ministry is more important than the lives of your own children. Can you imagine that the people who think like that, that's why they send their condemnation is so much greater. This is what the Lord said, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord who has made all things. Sons are heritage from the Lord, children are reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is a man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with the enemies in the gate. How terrible that we've got people who think that children are a curse, a burden, they're not a blessing. And if they're inconvenient and they come at the wrong time and they're going to embarrass you in society, your embarrassment is too great. Your respectability, your testimony is more important than the life of that child. It's better to kill a child. That's why many people in church kill their babies, because it is better to be a murderer than to be someone who is perceived as immoral. Abby Johnson said it was common for her to see children, young girls, on the operating table about to have their abortion, Praying the rosary. That means the Catholic girls. Catholics, for whom you would think pro life is absolutely unquestionable, they're on the operating table praying the rosary uh, while they're waiting for the abortion to be done. And you wonder why our church is on the state that they are. That's what the scripture says rescue those being led away to death, hold back those staggering towards slaughter, which is what we try to do with the life chains and the marches for life and our. Cyborg counseling and outside the abortion tricks like Mary Stokes abortion in downtown Cape Town. And we've had the joy of seeing people turned away at the last minute and people who've later given birth to the child, named the child after the cyborg counseling, took them into keeping the child. But while we've been on the pavement trying to persuade people not to go to Mary Stokes, normally on a Saturday morning, many a time we've seen it's not choice. Many times the girl wants to talk to you, but the father or the uncle or the boyfriend or the husband is forcing them in, dragging them in. You know, where's the woman's empowerment here? It's the unchoice. It's not choice at all. In many cases, the abortion is done against the will of the woman. It's been done under coercion and pressure of some male member of the family. You can't even call them fathers or husbands or boyfriends, whatever they are. They, they're not worthy of name even a man. 
Because not every male is a man, not every man is a gentleman. Like not every girl is a woman, not every woman is a lady. It's sanity. Although these days they're trying to erode all of those things. When we think of our life change, the question we've got to ask many of our friends is the words of Jesus. Could you not watch with me for one hour? You know, what we need is people who are going to be pro-life to every hour of the day throughout their life. But can we not get people to stand for one hour a year to make a stand for life? We stand for life. How difficult is it? How much sacrifice is involved just to take one hour? We've got to teach our people now choose life so junior children may live. We had a banner made, a scripture banner, with this verse from Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, outside Parliament, at the opening of Parliament, when Tabo became president in 1999. We know Tabo Mbeki saw it. He passed right by it. Within minutes of him driving through the gates of the Parliament, a group of, they looked like riot squad, but they were probably um, a SWAT team of the police, came out, full battle gear, confiscated the banner, and took it inside and burned it. Now, what is so offensive about this passage that President Tabenbeke would send his police to confiscate and burn the scripture banner? Now choose life. How offensive is that? So you and your children may live. What a horrible, hateful statement. Surely it must be burned. 